I can change it to this. Move forward to this. So this uh, talk was given to uh, incoming graduate class of uh, several university and several colleagues. And so that's why I think that kind of a title who uses very good for an aspiring scientist. Okay. And uh, uh, the next one, please. So I'm going to talk about science, you know, science for a better word, and what is thinking and what are the methodologies. All right. So the chief, uh, uh, you know, characters in this uh, talk is uh, Pursuit of science and process is the pursuit of the scientist. So one would like to understand uh, and pose some very few questions, and I'm sure by the end of the talk we will not find any answers, but we will uh, hopefully be thinking about some of them a little bit more deeply. All right. So the first question is: Is a scientist a professional like any other? Okay, a business executive in a company. A lawyer, at least, you know, and a setting, a class person. Is there, is there anything which, uh, which a scientist uh, ought to have which is different from other professions? Okay. And uh, if not, uh, then what are the objective constraints that may distinguish their pursuits from some of the others? And if, for instance, a scientist and an aesthetic both claim to have found some truth, say about the universe, then do we have criteria that, that may help us understand distinction and even similarity between the truths that we find? Okay. So, of course, there's an assumption here that all so called truths may not be universe. Next one, please. So, uh, the principal objective is to explore sharp modes of inquiry to create an audience that will provide intellectual stimulus to current and future scientists like me. Not only to think deeply and have an exciting life of discovery, but also develop the capability of critically examining the truths that you yourself find discovered. In my mind, probably the most important criterion of a scientist is to examine one's own doings very critically. Okay, before you bring it to the public, exactly. Sorry. Am I am I right? Am I at least within the framework I'm doing things? Am I right? And uh, it's extremely important to internalize that the understanding and spreading out of it, the limitation of one's inquiry is just as necessary as going over the grandeur of our achievement. So a good scientist paper often starts by saying, my theory is not valid here. This is not the domain in general. I'm not valid here. Okay. Because what does distinguish science from the other uh, approaches to truth often is that we are humble and we're very good at it. And uh, working through examples, we as imagine we will make this thing interactive. Rather than I don't really want the people speaking, we will, we will join together and try to figure out the things. Um, the slide that just there to provide tools for discussion. Okay, so do not at all hesitate to, to participate in this environment. That's all. So, uh, in, in order for me to kind of uh, illustrate rather than talk to the abstract. Let's begin and analyze an example. And that example comes from cosmology. Why cosmology? Because cosmology is something which fascinates us all. And it, it kind of 
that reveals such a large uh, part of our intellectual horizon that uh, we should see how interesting. So I talk about two cosmologies. One is the cosmology in which is expressed in the creation hymn of the oldest book in the world for the hymn. Okay. And I will, of course, not uh, subject you to, to the original language in which it was written. I will do the show you the English translation. Of that. And it's, 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 it's a very unique hymn about creation. That's what the poet does right from beginning to end. Okay. And uh, then I will do some idea of modern cosmology. Again, not going into the detail, but trying to show the contrast as well as similarities between them. And then from that, trying to kind of understand what constitutes science and what does it depend on. And of course, the, the opinion are my own prejudices. You know, so you do not have to be with them. Yes, but, uh, but you know, just uh, we will see what it And as I said, these are two different glorious and powerful quests. Okay. A priori, I mean, the grandeur in both. Okay. And uh, so I also stand to be extra sensitive to the events passing in time uh, in between that, uh, you know, 4,000 year old poem and what we do. So I am choosing the cosmology uh, primarily because it's the university best. And uh, it's very interesting that throughout history, the people who study cosmology, they somehow were uh, supposed to be intellectually superior. Those who speculated about the matter and substance of the universe, they really had a special place in our uh, understanding. Even though they may be, you know, so poor that you had to give them food to survive. But the fact that they were pondering over a big question somehow was always very bad. Okay, that's why to some extent it's something that we must perceive. Go ahead, please. Uh, you do not know the concept of dumb issues are not very much. Okay. So I'm going to quote uh, passages from this grand uh, and uh, and analyze them uh, in a in a somewhat uh, old So, analyze them in a, in a modern perspective. So that's the only perspective I have. Okay. Being very sympathetic to all the ancient modes of thinking, but the perspective obviously is something that I do not get. So, in the beginning, there is a grand pronouncement in the statement of his two pocket wife. So, the, 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 the gender. Things are my commentary, and the rest of it is a problem. Okay. So the point says then even nothingness was not, nor existence. There was no air then, nor the heavens beyond it, or covered it. Where was it? In whose keeping was there then the possible water in that side or that? So what he does is that uh, he's kind of uh, asking so many questions, so many unknowns. Right? And then he says, he gives a kind of qualitative descriptive of this in our language. Okay. And that is, then there was neither death nor immortality, nor was there then the thoughts of night and day. The one breathed windlessly and senseless thing. So you know, this is the concept of one. You don't quite know that about one But there's some uniqueness according to something. Okay. There was that one and there was no other. At first, there was only darkness wrapped in darkness. All this was only one thing in the water. So he kind of gives a kind of a quality description. Then he tries to introduce a little bit of dialects. He says, that one which came to be and closed in nothing arose at last, born of the power of heat. We still do not know what he means by heat, but there is some moving agent. 
which is propelling that one to take some action, to do something. In the beginning, desire descended on it that the that was a primal seed born of the mind. We still have no idea what mind is, what primal seed is, but he's trying to put together a certain picture which he put it there. Go ahead, please. And then he invokes the color. Like we say, you know, my chair is consistent with Einstein. Okay. So he says, the sages who possess their hearts with wisdom know that which is in to what which is not, and they have stretched their cords across the void and know what was above and what below. Seminal powers made fertile mighty forces below us and affecting the first impulse. So it's a bit like a jumble of words, all right? But at the same time, a picture is being presented, right? And then here's a question. Now, this is the most beautiful part of this book. Unlike many other ancient critics, he's not so sure that whatever I'm saying is written down. Okay? And in fact, that's where his scientific mind begins. He says, but after all, who knows? And who can say whence it all came? Okay? And how creation happened. And the gods themselves are later than creation. So this is the kind of thinking concept that I mean the gods really who come after creation. This is nobody has seen creation. How it all came about. So who knows truly when is the creation? And then he said, um, uh, that's all creation had its origin he. He again the one, whether he fashioned it or whether he did not. Okay. He who surveys it all from highest heaven, he knows, or maybe even he heaven. So I don't bore you with uh, those things, but it's it. And that really, in some sense, is an amazing humility for a writer of that period. He says that. Even maybe the creator doesn't know. These questions are so immense. These questions are so important. You know, all we can do is put our step in it. And that's what I'm doing. I could not tell you that I'm giving you this same knowledge. So, uh, this was the humility which I attracted to this point. Uh, before I found that it was a grand university, and everybody, every big philosopher. That leads to all this point and comments. Okay. So the point is beautiful, thought provoking, deep, and profoundly nice. It's trying to grapple with the most fundamental of problems, the nature and origin of the universe. Okay. And perhaps even the origin of sentience. What's wrong with sentience? It's the, uh, let's suppose, the uh, simply defined. It's the uh, kind of ability to get them, ability to be sentient. Go on, please. Uh, it is much more prosaic in the cosmology also. Uh, right. And uh, so I think I'm giving the right talk <laughs> from, the, from the next one. I'm going to take up. Okay. <laughs> So, so, so he says that even the creator may not know. You know, the, the point is absolutely. First of all, um, what urged the creator to create? I have no idea. Was there actually a creator? I don't know. So. And it's quite possible that the universe was created. Maybe the creator was there to know of all. After all, you know, just because I have written something, I don't necessarily know all its implications. Okay. How many times do you know that it will use simple or whatever? Just like the other, uh, just like the other uncertainty that we can hook it. We are also not sure that he's greater or not. Yes, exactly. So he, he simply is saying from his perspective, I do not, I cannot associate certainty with anybody. All right, so probably you all know. But my point, sorry, this is the general point. This is, this is the general, everyone uh, curious, even I have uh, some 
Nobody can come to you give the answer to that. The whole idea is to make you understand that there are no answers to most fundamental questions. Uh, you know, okay. it's, uh, let's see, let's go to this thing in okay. mind and try to understand. Okay. If I could answer, I will be with God, I'll be true. I'm not. Okay. So I am probably we are not uh, going to do this thing. This particular, uh, um, uh, there are many other aspects of Indian cosmology, which are very profound. But the most important thing is neither proposes a causal dynamic model or makes prediction near destiny. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a bunch of statements. You can take it or not take it, but it doesn't tell me that if you didn't do this, okay, if you are to conduct an experiment if the result was negative, then my theory is wrong. That nobody really ever thanks. That's what the answer. All right, now let me give you a glimpse of modern cosmology. Perhaps you are aware, but let, let's go to that. Um, this is the study of the universe as a whole, not of stars or not of galaxies, but the entire universe together. And um, astronomy and physics was creatively combined to unravel, if at all, perhaps the fragments of a grand picture. Uh, astronomy explores the physical content of the universe and physics provides a framework in which the information is on the okay. ship and hopefully the community will come. What distinguishes modern cosmology from ancient cosmology? MC, the Lord of the for modern cosmology. MC, as we have already seen, constructs traditionally quantitative models whose consequences must match what is actually observed. Okay? If not, the model has to be improved or it will be judged. Most important thing is every model is provisional. Okay? And time, greater understanding, more observation can be proved anyway. Nobody believes that there is a revealed truth. Yeah. And the most amazing thing is that the tiny elementary particle, as well as the immense cosmos, uh, as an entity, can be analyzed using the framework of similarly framed stringent matter systems. Okay, and that is absolutely amazing. Such luxuries were not available to either the poet or the philosopher. Cosmos. These tools were not a part of their education. So please go on. So there are many features of the physical system that one has to assume. Construct the simplest for scale. And I believe I've given you some idea earlier. So this is the leading order of the universe in the mark using. It's homogeneous, all right? And of course, that doesn't agree with our small observation, but you have to think of much larger scales than our eyes. Okay. And those scales really are the Hubble scale, which is the scale of the universe. But they, over there, matter is essentially the Hubble scale. Okay. And what is the greatest wonder of all is that even this foundation provided by as little as a homogeneous isotropic system allowed us to construct a thing that we could perform best. Next one, and this is again, you know, a physicist looked at an elephant from a distance. So his first theory thinks the elephant is a spherical particle, spherical, okay? And then eventually, he's far enough into the shape of the point particle, and you can write its analytics and understand its water. So this is the observation that he is reading. And uh, so a uniform isotropic interval universe filled with perfectly isotropic fluid. The matter, all the matter in the universe is an isotropic fluid. Okay. And as you all know, that isotropic fluid has only two attributes. One is pressure, one is energy density. 
Let yeah. me show you your tail is written in terms of exact two things. So such a fluid has only two defining physical quantities: the energy density and the pressure. So let's start with perfect case. And so when such a perfect isotopic homogeneous universe is allowed to evolve via Einstein equations, we actually derive result that gives simultaneously the structure of space time and the time history of evolution of the universe. There are any number of assumptions. Universe being treated as one action. Universe being treated such as that you know, it doesn't change in any direction. And it's filled with the matter which is simplest possible mathematical action. And uh, so the so-called Big Bang model of cosmology emerges as a concept of this very simple quantity. Forget about the GR calculation being done today, they are very complicated. But this was a calculation which a graduate student could do. All right? And the mathematics is accessible to all of you if you want to sit down and do it. So the Universe is expanding and it extrapolated backward. The universe will be formed in a very, very fast state. Okay. What is equally remarkable is that for such an evolving universe you can construct the entire time history of matter and radiation. What was matter dominated, what was radiation dominated, and so that's what kind of mixing, and how can we test the creation? Naturally, we were not there when the universe was very Part, but could it lead to phenomena that we can observe? I mean, we haven't seen uh, the Big Bang. We were not there. Human beings came into existence a lot later. But is there something from the Big Bang you know, event which we could observe? All right. Then we say that, well, all right, a theory seems to be okay. It may not be fully correct, but it seems to have elements on some good things. Next so I think this is just a kind of a game that for who are the, uh, the great scientists to call the future today, Friedman, the mind play, obviously, in English class, of course, Walker, Einstein in universe and expanding universe, and Hubble is this prominent evidence demonstrating that yes, indeed, the galaxy are the receiving from us at the rate which is consistent with the Einstein equation. So, so there was then the big cosmic climate. Accidentally discovery of the cosmic background radiation called CMD. Okay. Done by two, two well lab scientists who had no idea what they're looking for. They just put their antennas in space and found something totally unexpected, which right next door at Princeton who were actually constructing experiment finding. And the beat them. Okay, at that. So uh, the, it, it's amazing. And uh, there's a fantastic scientist called Robert Dickey that was his program. And uh, he didn't even get a Nobel Prize for that. The other guys who had no idea what they're looking at. <laughs> Not only they got the Nobel Prize, but they are supposed to be with this while they were working, they knew exactly what they wanted. And when these engineers on the Princeton died, you know, this was their phone, then they told them this is what you have found. <laughs> so science is again very interesting that way. So several events, observation, invention, discoveries, collated and integrated into the science of cosmology. The science is much bigger than any scientist, however creative or creative. That's another message that you should always next one you see. And this to give you some idea, Big Bang is really a very misleading dystopia. It was considered an insult. Most of the people, when expanding universe was discovered, they believed in a steady state of universe. So this was a shock. Oh, gee, you're saying there was a Big Bang? You know, you must be a bunch of idiots. All right, so Big Bang was a very insulting thing. But you know, it caught on. And I believe that if it wasn't called Big Bang, it would not become a household word. Nobody will be making the scene by it at some time. So it was fortunate that these guys were insulting the, the evolution cosmologists really got paid back 
the dead end stuck in hell. <laughs> okay, that's one thing. So we went through two grand approaches to cosmos. There is cursory, but just to kind of the experience of this. And these were stretched over immense time and spanning different years in the situation. Okay. The two, there could be no two different groups of people, you know, who gave us these two modes of thinking. So what is striking is that immense conceptual overlap. Both constructions are fueled by curiosity, thirst for knowledge, the desire to make sense of the universe around. Imagination, speculation so deep that I will dive in deep all the mind. The very poet, the later philosopher, the modern cosmologists are all very dashed to the basic perspective. None of them, you can say, this guy has a superior imagination or speculation ability or ability to think. They're all great thinkers. In fact, the ancient one was maybe a hack by a pointer. And the reason for that is also clear. We don't think, we are constrained in thinking. We know certain more things, and we say, I think he cannot go there. Um, the very poet's thinking was totally unlimited. He had no constraint because there was no knowledge base, you know, which he had to conform. <laughs> All right. And what does give a somewhat unfair advantage to the Modern cosmologists and distinguish it from the ancient cosmologists is very interesting addition to it. That has been the holy sin and relentlessly brought down. The modern cosmology depends on both the mathematically correct structure and the observational data required to construct such extremely complex. So he has this uh, advantage and the little thing. That's despite the irrepressible genius of ancient cosmologists could not construct science for the modern one. Okay. This was this was not something which uh, which which was lacking because they were not smart, or they were not intelligent, they were not uh, imaginative. All those things were there. Yes, sir. So, but the toolkit of the ancient cosmologists was curiosity, imagination. More daily speculation plus some explanation supported his connections, right? He was lauded and honored for this very profundity. In fact, many of us want them even today. They were excellent in what they did. With all the things available to them, they were great. Yeah. But the ancient cosmos did not create the sun. Okay? Either in methodology or in politics. Uh, most of all, based on its model, no destiny prediction was made. A skeptic, not overawed by his reputation and stature, I'm using the word his here because, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, all the, the authors of the ancient Vedas were like, or at least that's what we know. If there are the remaining contributors to that, and we still not very much. Okay. So, most. Uh, and in fact, there was often no attempt made towards the predictive model. It's not only that they were not given, it's not even they didn't even think that that was required. Okay. Most of the theories could not be refuted even in this. If you make a statement like it's either going to rain or not rain today, that statement is always there. But it's not something. It has no content. Okay. And um, so uh, they were supposed to be university and better. In fact, there was no mechanism even to associate any proof index to that. Okay. And uh, because such a thing simply did not exist. The scientific enterprise does must not lay claim to universal and error. That's the first humility that all scientists must have. It's much more humble. It can only have provisional proofs derived from a system of theoretical and experimental structure that proves only till proved in any field of their life. They can have a short span of proof, short span of ability, 
Bitcoin in the long span, like uh, hopefully quantum mechanics or the or the right? But the point is, it's not going to be one of my point is something to choose uh synchronized All right, thank you. So let's give it now a new twist to the discussion and add an extra dimension to provide why. So a great thinker long before the discovery of the positive and background radiation, let's suppose he had proclaimed that the whole universe is filled with energy. Okay. And there are people who have said the Now, and in 1964, the cosmic microwave background radiation will be very important. So the question is. Should we credit this thinker in the discovery of cosmic radiation? Yes, long before modern science. This is the kind of a controversy on my youth I face from my surroundings. This guy had discovered the problem. Okay. You know, whether it is from one tradition or another, that they knew the truth in the sun. And so this is where, in fact, to some extent, the crux of my talk. The question, therefore, is about our sincere and most scientific X. So we will refer to the proclaimer as Sage X. Okay, let's go to the next one. The, and Sage X now meets the modern cosmology. So the statement is the whole universe is filled with X. So let's say what Sage X does not tell us. What are the characteristics of this energy? Where does this energy come from? What's the distribution of energy in the universe? How may I measure this energy? And if I fail to detect this energy, what is more deep in fire? Will this conjecture be wrong? Okay, never tell us anything. Thus, despite the true value which is unity established by modern say, this conjecture by itself is not a part of science. Okay, and uh, it tells us nothing about the energy and has no critical science to be performed in the Contrast to the modern cosmologists, who say the energy is a relic of an ancient, very, very far past, that's the connection. Calculation show that it could uniformly fill the whole space. It should measure, it will be called the black body radiation with a temperature of 2.7. Okay. So the modern cosmologist conjecture on the other hand is totally refutable in this. For instance, by finding that radiation is not uniform in speed, or by finding that it's not that one. His theory is wrong, and in principle, we can prove that it's wrong. But say the axiom state when the universe is filled with energy, all right, profound as it may be, is that's not, um, is imaginative, powerful. And in this case, happens with two, but science is. Okay. And uh, we must strongly desist from giving it the credit that it doesn't earn, so fully giving it the credit that it does. Yes. So, how does conjecture get promoted into science? And I will give you three examples which are, uh, which are probably profoundly shaped the 20th century. And the word Agni Pariksha means trial by fire. Okay, so these are all uh, so the story of CM, right? Process, uh, micro, uh, it was, it, it lay dormant. The, the calculation that you can have a temperature of uh, approximately that one was done by the 1930s. Okay. And uh, for a long time, nobody even try to you know look for it. The principal group started uh, you know uh, this thing of course they were uh, they were uh, outlined by but it took 15 years before we could say that the so-called big bang model has any uh, you know uh, what should I say claim to be a, in the theory before that, yes, it was a very nice conjecture, 
and you could not. So it was extremely, and if they did not find that that was the English, they did not have to have died. It's like as expected. So here is something, and, and it's a discipline. There are things which follow from the other. They are not statements. Okay, a single statement never was to it, it, it must. Yeah. Then the second part is the story of the new thing. You guys know the story? They got a mission that found that its spectrum was continuous. Okay, and in fact, that was basically the products of the mission and uh, people were so disturbed with this that we need to the the the, the, the dean of the science said that yeah he was even willing to give up the principle of conservation energy and then probably as he said there was nonsense there is a particle being emitted along with the electron okay it's very difficult to detect because it has access by properties and it scatters the extra energy. And we could not find that in the nuclear reactor one day, and we could find a fair amount of the flux in the heat and the stuff. The neutrino hypothesis was not a valid theory to say it was a star. And of course, you know, the theory of evolution, all right? If we couldn't understand the structure of DNA, there was no way for us to see how evolution takes place. And uh, so we have, we have very strict, stringent tests in order to make a theory into something. Right? Just because some statement came to be true, or made by somebody, it does not make it. And science, by definition, is humble and restrained. It does not claim uh, universal truths because only thing that can make based on the structure is a conclusion I come to. Yes. And if I find that the evidence, even one single evidence contradicts it, it, it no longer remains a case. So then a physicist called something a theory is a big deal. Okay. In, in, in the normal uh, language, oh, it's just a thing. No, but a physicist, the theory is the ultimate. That's it. You do not go beyond that. So in order to meet a particular thing, uh, scientific, that scientific does not again mean superior, does not even mean the most desirable thing. We don't know yet how to um, define love scientifically, or even the right equation for that. That doesn't mean it's not very important. But science has a certain trigger, all right? And anybody claiming to be scientific, they better follow that trigger. No matter how great they are, no matter how ancient they are, no matter how profound things that they say. So I hope it gives you some idea of how to kind of gauge and understand. The very important thing is you must tell me under what conditions can your theory be proved. Even hypothetically. If you can't do that, then whatever your statements are not said. It's not even testability, it's the refutability in principle, which is the factor. Okay, and uh, I'm the best What about uh, mathematics? Is it uh, mathematics? Or? Mathematics in its purest form is a purely deductive science. Okay, so you do not have to justify the 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 S. Right? But pure mathematics, you assume a certain set of axioms, which is geometric. He writes down a few axioms and then he draws all the conclusions. 
you in principle, the, the actions are kind of self evident but there is no proof for that. Okay? Proof is again comes for that by large practice and by seeing the method. Mathematics does not have to conform to any reality. And yet, the mathematician bring up things we found which have a great application to understanding the universe. Who could have thought that I construct a physical quantity called a tensor and it's going to have anything to do with the, with the universe, right? So this is again a great compliment to the human mind. So if you now think of Riemann, Riemann was not a scientist, he was not a physicist. What he was creating was a deductive, deductive science. And deductive science by itself is not uh, the truth. True only in the sense that within a framework, uh, it's consistent. So that's its two things. You start with the set of axioms, the results that you deduce from that, they must not violate the axioms. So the Euclidean geometry prevailed for so long. Everybody thought that was it. Till we said, well, one of the axioms doesn't seem to be so evident. Okay. And it was then examining that axiom which led to non Euclidean geometry, which are so powerful in trying to understand the universe. And, 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 the, and the whole point is things build on that. Before the, it took 2,000 years almost for people to um, go beyond the Euclidean direction. And just for your uh, information, it's called Euclidean direction, but Euclid was not the one who proved most of the theorems. There was a whole lot of mathematicians, and most important of them was a gentleman called Bizox. He was a uh, he was a scholar at the middle of the All right. Uh, but you played correlated that, put together the entire mathematical knowledge. Uh, so the Euclid's elements are not just geometric, that all the mathematics made mathematical as well. And it was done in Alexandria rather than in Yeah. Yes. Yeah. This college was working for us points and ideas, but especially I was new concepts and mathematical calculations for me. Thank you very much. And I want to ask you which topic or which course that gives you this grand background. Uh, in this field, maybe, maybe like answer algebra because I want to read this when I back because since I, I got here some important new points and uh, when I back to my home, I would like to read all this even in each presentation. But for you specifically, which part of maybe that good mechanics, continuing mechanics, uh, or no, like heads up, this is what you do in the lifetime with people. Okay, so I can't really tell you, okay, you read this book or that particular thing. I, I, think, what he, I think what he's asking uh, is for you to write a book. So oh, write a book. I will write the book. I'm asking, for example, in my background, from different courses, uh, for example, uh, in my department, uh, I have uh, got uh, senior. A professor, uh, he gave me a course, my first chemistry of physics, and uh, that was the analysis. Those two courses, they give me a great background in my ability to work my PhD, dissertation, and other works. Just like that, for you, which topic or which uh, course that gives you uh, a big yeah. 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 No, I, I appreciate your comment. I cannot be quite. Answer them. Do I understand the question correctly? Um, I, I think you're referring specifically to his 
lecture today, the early part of the lecture. I think he is um, talking about the whole uh, plan. Yeah, right. He's not yeah. Talking. Right. The point in that what I am talking to you about is not just a plasma. It was essentially almost uh, the, the way to think about the principle. Plasma is being one of them. To give you a hint to my question, for example, why am I teaching and uh, why am I teaching in the class? For example, uh, little dynamics work. I would advise my students to be good in vector calculus. That's the fundamental. Yes. We teach from vector calculus like that. Like that. Yeah. So my question is like this is this like uh, which Okay, so I, I, I was thinking about that, that. and if I have any idea of suggesting a room, I am very happy to say. But thank you very much for appreciating that. Right. And uh, any any other questions? Because I think Professor Salim, you want to say something. Uh, at the conclusion, then. Uh, well, I suppose we are getting there. So right? I, uh, on behalf of, I think, the other participants and lecturers, I just want to say that. Maybe now most of you uh, know that this uh, plasma activity college and uh, during this was uh, in the past for four weeks, three weeks, so many activities. But as I know, I think Professor Mahajan has been and uh, should be speakily and devotedly organizing with the help of uh, ICT such activities for the at least as I know. Mm, more than 30 years. You may tell us maybe four or not. So I have been in many activities, not all, but what I see that there have been many lecturers all over the world, and there are many people have been assisting him, but he was the main force behind this. And uh, I think we all should at time thanks to him because he has always been as lucky, kind to the young students, people inspiring. And helping even I think lecturers and everyone. So I think at the end, because he has been appreciating us, encouraging us, so we should also thank him. Right. Um, but uh, for me, the most uh, important uh, thing to be thank you is that uh, you take something extra back. Both in the skills and also in the modes of thinking. Mm. Because that is the second one is just as important. Okay. And, uh, and then finally, for you to be very effective um, intelligentsia in your own societies, you must uh, perpetuate some of the culture that you develop and which will help you to be good. And that will be the biggest, uh, um, I call it the trace the spirit, that will be the biggest compliment to the trace the spirit. And I have great confidence that many of you have a very interesting, you know, I, uh, every one of you has shown a great amount of interest when you have taught something within the world. And I do see, uh, you know, uh, brightness in your eyes. They, they light up when you when you hear something you haven't heard before. And that's what is the most satisfying thing for a teacher. I have not given a course, but I have kind of made you wander uh, in a landscape, you know, that there are all kinds of pretty things to see. And I'm sure you will adopt some of them and you will take them apart. So ending the school is always painful. Right, it's uh, it's kind of uh, we we do act and behave and like a family for uh, for all a few months, and in some sense these are the only two weeks where I have some free time. Because when I'm back home, I'm occupied all the time, and so nobody gets to talk to me as much as you people do. Nobody gets to hear my language as much as you guys do. Yeah. And uh, uh, so, 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 in fact, this is very interesting 
My injunction will be his account to ICPP is probably most in gas because that's there. I bring all my time and uh, thank you very much for being very friendly. Yeah. And uh, it was a joy to have you. Right. And I hope that uh, we will continue this activity that keep on this channel. Okay. But, but do try to create a scientific atmosphere around your own investors. Okay. I will give you back. You guys do what I mean by Thank <laughs> you.